Morning, Cornerstone family. We're so glad you're joining us for Church Online. Whether you're tuning in from out of town, in the car, or from your home in the Kansas City area, we're so glad you're joining us in worship. Thank you for bringing the Church Online. There's a lot going on in the life of Cornerstone, so bear with me as I share some of that with you. We just had Parents' Night Out on Friday. We had over 100 kids sign up and 25 volunteers serve. Cornerstone, thank you so much for giving your time and energy to serve the next generation. We had 26 families come to Parents' Night Out for the first time. This event is such a great way to serve our community, so thank you for your prayers and your participation. Have you been craving some Kansas City barbecue? Us too. Join us at our next fellowship dinner on Thursday, November 17th. Stop by anytime between 6 and 7.30 at the Joe's Kansas City Barbecue Leewood location. We hope to see you there. Even though it's November, we're already looking toward Advent and the Christmas season. Join us on Sunday, November 20th at 3 o'clock to help us decorate the church for Christmas. No need to sign up. Just come ready to decorate on Sunday, November 20th at 3. Thanks for serving. And lastly, a quick reminder that we're supporting Mission Southside's Tree of Hope for our November mission focus. Choose the gifts you'd like to donate from the tags on the Tree of Hope in the lobby. Place the unwrapped gifts in the missions bin during the month of November. Thank you for your donations. As always, these announcements and other resources can be found by scanning the QR code on your screen. Thanks for being a part of what we're doing here at Cornerstone. Good morning, church. Join me in our call to worship this morning from Psalms 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul boasts in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord, and He answered me, and delivered me from all of my fears. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in Him. Amen. Let's continue in worship. Would you say with me our confession of sin today? Lord most gracious, do not rebuke us in your anger, nor chasten us in your wrath. You are holy and we cannot stand in your presence, yet you have called us to come to you. We feel unworthy, for we have failed you again and again. We feel like running away, yet you keep calling us. Have mercy on us, Father. Heal us from our sin, for we are troubled. We are troubled by how our sins have hurt others. We are troubled by how the sins of others have hurt us. Lord, your ways are right. When we have refused to follow them, we have found out how right they are. Have mercy on us for the sake of your Son, who died to free us from our sins. Amen. And now, church, hear this assurance of pardon coming from Micah 7. Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot 
and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Jesus, bless our worship today. Bless our listening. Open our hearts, Father, so that we can hear what you have to say, God, for all of us who are joining here today, listening to your word, opening up your word together. Would we as a church, Father, feel compassion for the lost, for the broken, for our neighbors, for our city, for our community, Father? Would you please just have your way in us, God, so that we might move where you want us to move and move how you want us to move? Father, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for this time. Let us not walk away from your word the same, God, but be changed by it. Let that be our prayer, Father, every time we encounter scripture in your presence. We love you, Lord. Thank you. And teach us to pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. for our new preaching series as we begin today. We're going to spend the next three weeks taking a look at what the Bible tells us about Jesus Christ. So as we consider, as we gather each time for worship, we are opening up God's word because he has a story to tell us. He has a story that he's been revealing in his word. If you have a Bible, this story is one giant story of what God is doing to redeem people to himself, how he gathers people and he gathers them from all the corners of the earth and gathers them into his church family. And he uses his local church, his body, to be an expression of what he's doing in this world. And this is the main arm of what God is doing in the world. He's working through his church and through his people in our life. And so this morning, we're going to begin to take a look at how people have often looked at Jesus and God. I don't know about you, but I'm sure some of you have questions. Some of you have some doubts in your mind about uh, where you are with the Lord and what the Lord means to you. Some of you might have even come here and you're quite skeptical and you're trying to find out what God is doing and how he works in this world so that you would have a greater understanding. And maybe you've declared yourself an agnostic, someone who believes that there's no way we can know God if there is one. Or maybe even an atheist who would say, well, there's absolutely no God and there's uh, nothing that we could know about God in this world. So today, we're going to see a passage of scripture where God is going to reveal himself to the people who have questions, the people who have doubts, the, the people who can be skeptical. And so we want to remind you that we want to be that kind of place for people who would come through the doors, that we would be a place where people can come and explore and also ask the questions and not be fearful of any question that they may ask, knowing that we want to try and answer from God's word. We want to come to an understanding, an understanding of what God has said in his word. And so we are going to preach every Sunday the opportunity to hear the good news of what Jesus Christ has done and why we exist and what is the purpose of our existence. We want to tell that message. And so in this three weeks, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to learn about knowing who Christ is and what he's done for us. Then we're going to learn about what it means to follow Jesus and what does it mean to live our life for him. And then we're going to look at what he calls us to do, that we're to confess Jesus wherever we live and work and play. We've just spent about a month looking at that in some detail. We're going to, again, remind ourselves of the confession that is part of our expression of who Jesus is. So in a sense, Martin, as he was baptized this morning, he was confessing what Jesus means to him. And just as you were baptized, and you remember your baptism, and if any of you haven't been baptized and you are a follower of Jesus, then we want to encourage you that Jesus calls you to be baptized. Not that it saves you, but it is a reminder. It's a work that God is doing, and he uses it to strengthen you in your walk. And so we'd love to talk to you about that if that's something that you have not done in your life. 
But I want to remind you that the Bible tells this story that we are in need of a savior. Our greatest problem is our sinfulness. And this is the situation that we don't understand that much and that well. Because most of us, if we are unbelieving, we don't believe that there is sin and a problem in our life. But if we begin to look at who we are and what we do with our life, we love to be in control. We love to be independent of anything. And in this nation, that's sort of what we've built this nation on is our independence. We don't want anyone telling, especially the king of England, we don't want them telling us how much taxes we need to pay. It's an example of what we are like as human beings, that we don't like anybody telling us what to do. We're in control of our life. And therefore, we trust our own independence. We trust ourselves more than we trust anything else in this world. Well, the Bible is going to tell you that is a problem for you. And it's a problem for mankind because that's the same kind of thinking that got this world messed up in the first place. And the Bible begins with a story in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, about a couple, Adam and Eve, that God created. And they were created to be in relationship with him, and they were able to enjoy the presence of the Lord with them. But there was a day when someone put a temptation in their mind. The devil came into the garden and shared with them that, look, God just wants to keep you from having joy in this life. And if you really want life, then eat from this tree and you'll be just like God. And that became the appetite of their heart. They wanted to be just like God. They wanted to be God themselves. And Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord. They acted out their independence. And from that moment on, all the people that have been born afterwards, that's the way we enter into this world. We enter into this world with that being our problem. And this is how the Bible displays and points or develops the picture for us to understand what God needed to do. But God does not leave us in that state. God has said he would take care of what we could not take for ourselves. And he begins to tell them the story that one day I'm going to come and I'm going to restore all these things into the rightful place. And that's what the story of the Bible is all about. How God has come, he is the creator of you and me, and we were meant to worship him and not ourselves. And our sinfulness is that we'd rather worship ourselves than worship God. And so that became the problem. And so when we hear the story that we have today, it's going to tell us about one of the core doctrines of the Christian faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, in that story, we are told that Jesus came, and he came as a baby. We're going to celebrate that this month of December. We celebrate that each year, and we call it the Advent. That meant the coming of God to to man. We call it the incarnation of Jesus Christ, or the incarnation of deity. Jesus came and became man. He was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem, in that little city in Jerusalem. And in the coming of Jesus in that baby form, we have the greatest rescue begin to happen for all of mankind. Because Jesus came to rescue us and save us from ourselves. And in these stories, God is going to unveil that for you and me to understand that this Jesus is like no other God on this earth. You see, we've made gods out of our own mind. We've created many gods. We can make them out of issues that we might even make with our hands. So you've seen people that might have idols in their home. That's sort of an archaic way. But we make idols in our heart. We make the things of this world be something that we love and cherish, and we're trying to find satisfaction in them. And the Bible is trying to tell you, and God is trying to explain to you, that only God was meant to be your satisfaction. And you'll never find true satisfaction until you find him. And your heart is going to be restless until you find your rest in Jesus Christ. That's the story of the Bible. That's the story of why Jesus had to conquer even death for you and me. It was a game changer for God's people. Because no other religion in the world teaches that their God came and suffered and died for his people. Only Christianity, this is what makes Christianity stand out from all the world religions. 
All the other religions are going to tell you that you're really the enemy of the gods and you need to appease them by doing something in your life. You might have to make a pilgrimage to uh, this place or that place. You might have to live a certain way or follow the certain code in order to please that God. So you're working your way into his presence. You're trying to appease his wrath. But in Christianity, which makes it so different from all the religions of the world, for those of you who are trying to make sense of who Christianity is or what Christianity is all about, we need to understand that here the story is that God would come into this world and rescue you and me. He would do what we could never do for ourselves. And Jesus has done that on the cross and his victory over death where the grave would not hold him down because that's what the world thought was going to happen. They thought they were quashing a rebellion and putting it down and putting him to death. They thought, okay, no one else will follow him once he's gone. Let's get him out of our hair and we will see what happens. But you know what? That's exactly the opposite of what happened in this story. Because Jesus showed his power even over the grave, the awesome power and might of God of restoring Jesus to life, resurrecting him from the grave so that we no longer have a God who is remaining dead in the ground. And all the other religious leaders of the different religions of the world are still in the grave and still in the ground. There is no story of resurrection other than the Christian faith. And the story that God reveals in his Bible for you and me to understand and to believe in. And what we're going to see in the book of the Bible is that all of these chapters, all of these stories, all of these books were gathered by God to tell you about him and what you need to know about him and what you need to know about yourself and how you can be saved. So every book of the Bible is worthy of reading because The purpose of those books is to tell you something about God and to tell you about this world and to tell you about yourself. And these stories are to show you your need for your creator, your maker. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd love for you to turn to John chapter 20. Because here we're going to have a story. We're going to see somebody who's pretty skeptical. He's a follower of Jesus. You know his name probably from your Sunday school classes of old. Or maybe you've never even heard of this man. His name was Thomas. He was an apostle. He was one of the called ones from God. And this is the story of what happened on the day that he saw Jesus. Now Thomas was one of the twelve, meaning the twelve people that Jesus had called to be followers of him. His name was also called the twin. That was what his name literally meant. And was not with them when Jesus came. So what we're hearing is a story about what had happened a few days earlier. Jesus resurrected from the grave and he was greeted by the women who went to the graveside. Remember, they go out on Sunday morning to go and and take uh, some flowers, take uh, care of the uh, gravesite. And as they get there, they see the stone rolled away, and the Roman soldier tells them he's gone. And then two angels appear to these women and tell them the story of what has happened. And they said, why are you waiting here? Go and tell the others. So they rush back to Jerusalem, they walk back into the town, they get back to the gathering of God's people, and they tell the good news of what's happened. Well, that happened on that Sunday morning. And Thomas wasn't there. And that begins to show us what's happening. And he says this, when he was not there with them, when they all saw it, so the other disciples came to him and they said, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands and the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. So eight days later, His disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them this time. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, Thomas, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? 
Well, blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. And now we come to John's editorial note. John's the author of the Gospel of John, and he's saying this. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So when John writes these things, he is writing for a purpose. The whole Gospel of John, and I would encourage you this way, if you are new to Christianity, if you are new and you have many questions, maybe you don't know who Jesus is and you don't understand what he's been doing and why it's important to know him and why we would follow after him and why we'd gather every Sunday, I'd encourage you to start with the book of John. This gospel is a, a glorious gospel. Actually, a lady in the first service told me that this passage of scripture was what helped her husband come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That he was someone that was very much like Thomas, who needed evidence, who needed this kind of understanding. And as he read the Gospel of John, because someone who wanted to share the faith with him told him and gave him a Gospel of John, and he began to read it, and he read it from beginning to end. And when he got to the end and he heard these words, it was what the Lord used to reveal himself to that man. He has since now gone to be with the Lord. But what a testimony of what God can do in the hearing and the reading of God's word and what he could do in this service right now with us and some of you who may not know the Lord and may have no relation and haven't put your trust in him and you're sitting here doubting him and you're skeptical of him, but you've been here week after week, maybe year after year, and the Lord is calling out to you and giving you these stories so that you would know what it means to believe in him and to put your trust in him. And so here is Thomas in this kind of situation, and John is making a point. He's trying to tell us this is the summary of his book. We could look at this story as the summary of everything that John was trying to do with this gospel. He wants us to come to belief in Jesus Christ. He wants you to see him truly as the son of God who came to rescue you from your sins. He begins the gospel with, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. We have these famous words and what John was pointing to was that this is Jesus who he was talking about. He is God. For all those that doubt, he's not just a good teacher. He's not just a, a wonderful religious leader that's worthy of our admiration. He is the son of God. And that's what the gospel is going to boldly proclaim for you and me to hear. And that's what the Bible is going to explain to you, that Jesus is the son of God who came to rescue you. And so as we hear the story unfold... We hear the gospel presented by John so that you and I would have an opportunity to respond, an opportunity to look at these stories, hear these stories, and then say, what must I do with this Jesus? And this is what Thomas is doing here. You see, the disciples were amazed at what they witnessed on that first Easter Sunday morning. But let me tell you this, Thomas was like all the other disciples. You might say, well, he's the doubting one. He's the skeptical one. Really, the story is going to tell you about what great faith he has in Jesus Christ. Because these disciples were not that far off from, from him. Do you remember what happened when the ladies went back to Jerusalem and went into the upper room and told the other disciples? What did they do? They heard the story, and they wanted to see for themselves if it was true. So what do we hear? We hear that a few of them, Peter and John, the one who would write this gospel, were the ones who needed to see more. They needed to have more evidence. So what did they do? They run their way to the tomb. And they get there, and one is bold enough to walk into the tomb, and they sees the grave clothes that are now folded up and laying on the ground with no body in it. Now, in the traditions of how they buried people in those days, they would take a hundred pounds of spices and wrap the body. So you've seen probably King Tut's uh, exhibit has come through Kansas City, hasn't it, I believe? I know it's come through some of the cities that I've been in. And so I've gone and I've witnessed what mummies look like. It's fascinating. But they would wrap the body with spices and a hundred pounds of that stuff was laid around Jesus and he was wrapped in linen cloth and now the tomb was empty there was no body the spices were cast all over the ground within the tomb and the disciples sit there 
and are amazed. And that very day they appeared, he appeared to them in the upper room. And he made a visible display and they saw his wounds, they saw his body, and Thomas wasn't there. But now, now we hear the story of what happens with this Thomas. In this story, it's eight days later. So for a whole week, when the disciples have been telling him, well, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't believe what we saw. And he said, well, I can't believe what you saw. He would not listen to James and John and Matthew and the testimony of the other disciples. It wasn't good enough for him. He needed more. He needed to see it for himself. And that's often what you and I are saying about God. You see, we barter with God in so many ways. Lord, if you get me out of this mess, then I will believe in you, and I will live for you for the rest of my life. Lord, if you cure me from this disease, then, then I will do my best to live for you the rest of the days that I have. You see, we begin to barter with God. We, this is the way we are. This is the way we're wired. We have these questions, and we begin to think that we're going to set it according to our terms. And so we have people that will often say, Lord, if you do this for me, then I will do that. But you know what? When you put your trust in miracles or signs and wonders, it doesn't always lead to belief. Can I give you an example in the Bible? When Moses was liberating the Israelites from Egypt at that time, the signs and wonders that Moses was able to do, do you remember the plagues? Do you remember the movie Charlton Heston was part of? The Ten Commandments? Now, we thought that was pretty good graphic artwork being done. It's not in comparison to what you can do today. But in that time, we saw and witnessed and we could imagine what it was like to see the plagues of locusts and frogs or the water turning into blood or Moses striking the rock and then the water parted and they were able to walk across dry land. And we would think, Lord, if you would just do that in my day, if you would just show me your power, then I will believe in you and I'll go tell everyone else. Well, you know what? There were many that were there that witnessed all of those examples and signs and wonders and they never came to believe. Pharaoh was one of them who had a front seat to all of these signs and wonders, but he did not follow the God of Israel, the one true God, because he was more entertained with the fact that he was more amused with himself and wanting to be God himself. So don't put your trust in saying, well, if I just had the Lord do something in my vision and in my sight today, then I would believe that's not necessarily true. But what's fascinating in this story, what Thomas needed, he wanted to be able to touch. He wanted to put his hand and his finger into the wounds that Christ had. And he said, if that, listen to what he said, unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. And you know what? Some of you have sat here and you've said that to God. Unless you do this for me, Lord, I will never believe in you. So look at the response that Jesus gives to Thomas. He comes in the room eight days later he gets in there mysteriously. The door is locked, the story's going to tell us, but he, he's able to come right through the walls. And he stands in their midst. There's a miracle that happened in their midst. That should have been enough. And Thomas then hears the words of his risen Lord who said, peace be with you. He uses that wonderful word, shalom. May your well-being be upon you, is what Jesus was saying, because of what he's now accomplished in the cross and what he's accomplished in his resurrection. And then he turns immediately to Thomas, because you see, he knows Thomas's heart. He knows Thomas's heart better than he knows, than Thomas knows. And that's true of you today. God knows you better than you know yourself. But look at what Jesus does in response. He stoops to what... Thomas needs. Okay, Thomas. He could have said to Thomas, Thomas, I'm here. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. I've resurrected from the grave. That should be sufficient for you. I have been in the ground for a few days, and here I now am standing in your presence. You were there when I fed the 5,000. Thomas, you were there when I healed the dead man. You were here when you saw resurre resurrection in the life of Lazarus. You witnessed all these things, and yet it still was not enough for Thomas to believe. And so what does Jesus do? He said, Thomas, come here. Come here. Take your finger and put it in the wound. 
And take your hand, and I want you to stick it in the side of my rib cage where the Roman soldier put the spear, reminding us and showing us that Jesus had truly died. And there he offers that opportunity because he, he knows what Thomas needs and he's willing to offer that. And that's what the Lord will do. He'll meet you where your questions are and where your doubt is. And he will answer and he's saying, come, come and taste and see what I can offer to you. There's a wonderful picture, an art piece that has been made. And I've seen this piece over. It's called The Incredulity of Judas meaning the skepticism that was in him. I'm going to have it shown on the screen here. It's a beautiful piece of art. And look at the, how Thomas is bending over and he's sticking his finger in the side of Christ. And look at the apostles that are behind him, looking over his shoulder, eager to see and hear what Thomas now believes. But what's fascinating with this photo or with this artwork and a famous piece that hangs in one of the great galleries in the world is that this never happened. When I was growing up, this is what I thought Thomas did. I thought he actually put his finger in the side, put it in the wounds. But if you read the text and we begin to hear what it says, that's not exactly what happened. We hear that Thomas didn't have to go to that extent. Before he even has to touch, he's already come to belief. Jesus has led him there. And do you hear what Jesus hears from Thomas's mouth? Instead of Thomas running over and doing that, he already cries out, my Lord and my God. Now, the two words that he uses, Lord and God, were the Old Testament words that were called Yahweh. So if you have any Christian or Jewish friends, they would never pronounce the word Yahweh because they felt it was too holy and sacred to use that word. And here is now Thomas using that very word and saying, Jesus, you are my Lord. You are Yahweh. And then he uses the word my God. And he's using both of these terms to tell you. And John wants you to hear that what Thomas is proclaiming is the greatest confession that's found in the Bible. Peter had a confession, but this one's even greater. Because he's acknowledging who Jesus truly is. He is the one who created it all. He is the one that's worthy of all of our adoration. He is the one that is to have first place in our life. And this is what Thomas learned in this little adventure and this encounter with Jesus. You see, God gives us enough evidence for us to see and understand who he is. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn to Romans chapter 1 and listen to this passage. Paul is going to write to the people in Rome, the Christians that were there, and he explains to them this uniqueness about what happens in this world and how God created it. It says, for what can be known about God is plain to the world because God has shown it to us. For his invisible attributes, and what we mean by attributes is his character, and he's going to describe it. Namely, this is his in, in, invisible attribute, his eternal power, his divine nature. So when we saw it in the life of Moses parting the waters, we saw his eternal power. We saw his divine nature. And they've been clearly perceived by the people of the world ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. This is what Paul wants you to understand. In the things that have been made, they are crying out to the recognition and giving evidence that God exists in this world. So that every one of us, you and me, are without excuse. So we can't stand before the Lord and say, you know what, Lord? <coughs> no one from Cornerstone came to me and told me about Jesus Christ, so I, I should get a free pass. Let me into heaven. The answer would not be what you think. The answer would be, I have revealed myself to you throughout all of my creation. It has been crying out to you to believe in God being the creator. That's what he's saying here. For although they knew God, they've been able to witness and see all of these things. This is what any unbeliever is experiencing and what you experienced before you knew God. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God and, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, what we did with all of this created order, we suppressed the message that it was telling. We stamped it down. We didn't want to believe it. We turned our eyes away from it. We darkened. We became blind, spiritually blind. 
and claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Now there's a testimony of what is before us and in this world that God wants you to know and understand. So when you drive across Interstate 70 into Colorado, and many of you have gone there to maybe ski, or maybe you've gone to Breckenridge or Vail, and these are beautiful places. And as you drive through those mountain scenes, you see the beauty of the Rocky Mountains. You see the beauty of these beautiful forest trees. You see the, the rocks, the rivers, the, the creeks, the lakes, all of these things. You see their splendor and their glory. And do you know what they're all doing? They are crying out that there was a God who created them and put them here. And it's crying out to you to understand that you have been created by God and he put you here all of creation. And then when we go outside at nighttime, in the summer when we were at our summer home, one of the things we love to do is to go lay on the dock at about midnight at night. Lay flat on our backs and we look up into the sky and we counted how many satellites were passing by. They weren't created by God, but they were created by man. But anyway, I'm sorry, I'm getting off track. Those weren't the things that made wonder, even though it's a remarkable work to think that we created something that's floating around in space and that far away and people can go to it and live in it for a year or so. But what's more startling is the story. And the new telescope that NASA now has, and when you turn on the news, every once in a while I get news updates about some of the, did you see the pillars of creation that the new Hubble, not the, it's the Weber um, telescope. It was able to show the pillars of creation that the, the other one was able to show us before, but now we see it in all of its glory and splendor. And what we see when we were laying on the dock, we saw shooting stars, which were comets going across. The, the way we, we looked up, we could see the, the moon. We saw planets where you had that little sky app that you could put your phone up and it would tell you where the planets were. And we were having great joy of marveling at what God has done. And that's what all of creation is doing for this world. It's proclaiming that there is a creator and you have been one of the created ones. And there is one who has made you and you were made for him. And all of creation is crying out that way. And this is what Thomas should have known and understood. But he needed more. And even in the needing more, Jesus met him where he needed more. And that should give you encouragement and hope with some of the doubt that you might be dealing with in your life and skepticism that you may have about God. But when we look at the created order and we see what has happened, we need to understand that we have a Savior who came to rescue us because we were blind. We are spiritually blind, and we can't see God in all this splendor and glory. And he wants to reveal himself, and he has done so in his Son, Jesus Christ. So when the resurrected Jesus is standing before Thomas, the only words that could come out of his mouth were, my God and my Lord, acknowledging his allegiance now to Jesus, just as we saw somebody coming for baptism and doing the same thing, that each and every one of us, when we become a follower of Jesus, that's what we're saying, is that we put our faith and trust in this one because there's no one else like him. There's no one in the world like him. And we so desperately need him. And that's what the story is trying to show you. Charles Spurgeon said this, incarnate deity is, that, is a thought that has never been invented by a poet's mind, nor reasoned by a philosopher's skill. Incarnate deity, the notion of the God that lived and bled and died in human form instead of guilty man, is itself its own best witness. The wounds are the infallible witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what happened to Thomas. The wounds were an evidence for him to truly know who Jesus is because he would go to war for you and me. He would allow his body to be tortured and mangled, pierced for your transgressions. He would do all of this because he loved you, because he knew you couldn't do this for yourself. So he said, I'm going to come down out of heaven. I will go and rescue them because they have no way of rescuing themselves. And when he came, he created the greatest rescue story in human history. And he's been redeeming people to himself. He's been rescuing us like God did in the time of Moses. But now we have his son who's been revealed to you and me for us to believe in him, to put our trust in him. 
So Jesus said, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now what he's saying there is every one of us in this room, we're not there when Jesus resurrected from the grave. We, it's impossible. It's 2,000 years later. So they were able to have an eyewitness account. But for you and I, we now have the eyewitness account of somebody else. Just like Thomas was, who could have heard the testimony of the apostles, but he didn't think it was enough. And some of us are doing the exact same thing now. We want Jesus to appear on our road to Damascus, just like he did in Paul. We want him to show up like he did to the people on the road to Emmaus. But what God is saying, there's a blessing that we would believe when we haven't seen him and we haven't seen his hands, but we know he has come and the testimony has borne witness to what Jesus has done for us. And Jesus is saying, you will be greatly blessed by the Lord because you have walked by faith, not by sight. It was a little bit of a rebuke to Thomas who needed the evidence, needed it firsthand. But for you and me, we all walk by faith and put our trust in Jesus Christ in that way. And this is what Jesus is saying. And then John cl concludes this little section. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's what Jesus offers to you and me. And all of these stories, the whole story of the Bible is telling you this story that this is what you need to do to believe and to have eternal life. Oh, we all want life, don't we? Doctors are trying to find the cure for the diseases that we have. A cure for cancer would be a wonderful gift in this world. We were all longing for a cure to COVID, and we, by God's mercy, were given the opportunity to see in lightning speed, never in history of mankind before did we see such a pr production happen. Warp speed is what it went by. And yet we long for life to be living longer. We look for the fountain of youth. We have stories that sort of make that be a, a dream and a hope. But you see, that's what's in us because we have eternity written in our hearts. That's the way we've been created. And so we have this longing for eternal life. And what the Bible is saying, if you want that, here's where you find it. If you want it, it's found in Jesus and him alone. So James Boyce, who was a pastor in Philadelphia at 10th Presbyterian Church, he wrote this. He said, no case is hopeless. No case is, your case is not hopeless. God took Abraham, the pagan, the unbeliever, and made him into a pillar of faith and the father of his people. He took Moses, the stammerer, and made him into the greatest vehicle of communication in the world or in the world of God until Paul. And he made the shepherd boy, David, into a king. He took Peter, the weak, and turned him into Peter, the rock. And he took John, the son of thunder, the author of this gospel that we we're looking at today, and made him into the apostle of love. He took Paul, who was the persecutor of Christians, and made him into a faithful ambassador and a martyr for Jesus Christ. How he can do that for you. Allow him to do it. Believe on Christ. Rather than being faithless, may you be the one who, like Thomas, is now faith, found faithful. Full of faith. You remember what Jesus said to Thomas? Thomas, stop your disbelief and now believe. And that is what Jesus is saying to you this morning. Stop your unbelief and skepticism and find your reality, your life in him and believe and put your trust in him for your salvation. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that challenges us in so many ways. It shows us what we are to believe and what we're to trust in instead of ourselves. And so we thank you that you would love us so much that you would come down out of heaven to rescue us from our sinfulness. And today, as we celebrate this meal, the Lord's Supper, we are thankful in what it symbolizes and what it teaches us and reminds us of, of your great love for us, that you would allow your son to be tortured and mangled and hung on a tree, impaled with nails and a spear in his side, all for us. Oh, Lord, there's no other God in, on this earth that has ever tried to rescue us in that way. Only you have. 
And so we give you praise this morning as we come and we are reminded to come and taste and see in this celebration. So use this now for your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we have the joy of celebrating the Lord's Supper with you again this, this month. And we have the reminder that Jesus Christ came and he died in our place. As the Gospel of John wanted us to understand that Jesus was the one who would come and be the Lamb that would take away the sins of the world. And in his death and burial and resurrection, Jesus died for our sin and made the remedy for you and me. And so we cherish the time around the table. We cherish the fact that the Lord reminds us through this work what he has accomplished. And we are reminded of God's great love for you and me. So as we participate today, may you rejoice in what Jesus Christ has accomplished on your behalf. And may you believe, as Thomas did, that Jesus became our Lord and he is our God. And so as we rest upon him and what he has done and his faithfulness, we then are follow in faith with him. So come to the table today and enjoy what God has accomplished for you, what you could not do for yourself. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. And then he took the Passover cup. It was part of the celebration of the Lord's Supper and the Passover meal at that time. They were remembering what God had done in Egypt, that they were liberated from their enemies. And that the passing over of each home was because of the blood that was put on the doorposts of each home. And so in that meal, Jesus said, this cup, which is part of the new covenant, that is made in his blood, we are reminded that Jesus now has become our Passover lamb. Jesus is the one who comes to take our sins away. And through the shedding of his blood and through the offering of his, of his body and the torture and the mangling of his body, on our behalf, he did it so that you and I would be made right with him. So as you come and eat this morning, as you taste and see the goodness of God, may you be reminded of God's true love and joy for you and his delight in you so much that he would send his son to come for you. So let's go to the table and joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would take these elements and set them apart for their holy purposes in our life. Lord, increase our faith and strengthen our walk with you that we would go from this time knowing greater your love for us and knowing the extent of your love seen in the giving of your son upon the cross, in his death, his burial, and most importantly, his resurrection, his victory over death. May that encourage us in our daily walk for the days that we have upon this earth. Bless our time together and allow us now to come and taste and see the goodness of your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take, eat, and enjoy the presence of the Lord with us spiritually. May you be reminded of God's love for you. God bless. Lord, we come to you humble and lowly. We come to you knowing your only. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Ooh, ah. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait jesus is calling come and trade trade your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born 
Jesus is calling, come, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood, oh, come, oh, come to the altar. Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.
white as snow. No other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, our message this morning has been reminding us what it means to have belief in Jesus Christ. Thomas was one that was skeptical. He had a lot of questions, and maybe that's where you are too. But did you notice what Jesus did for Thomas? He stooped to Thomas's request. He offered him the chance to stick his finger into his wounds and allow him to stick his finger in his side. But in what Jesus had done for Thomas, Thomas came to realize when he saw Jesus Christ in his resurrected body, he saw that Jesus had died for his sons. He began to realize what it means to trust in God and not in himself. And so the Lord led him to faith that day. And the Lord can do the same in your life. If you have the many questions, the Lord is answering those questions through his word and through a sermon like one today. And the Lord uses many things to reveal himself to you. But he has revealed himself in his word and through his son, Jesus Christ. So we encourage you to look to Jesus for your salvation and not yourself. And we pray that you would put your trust in him. And just as Jesus said to Thomas, stop disbelieving and now believe. That's the call that we offer to you. Come to Jesus today. Come and know him as Lord and Savior. And all it requires is that you would put your trust in him and you would rely upon him and him alone for your salvation. So may you turn from your sinfulness and rest on Christ's righteousness and rejoice in what Jesus Christ has done for you. Now, if that's something that you want to do today, if that's something that has happened in your life as you've watched some of our services online, we'd love for you to share that through an email or share it through a letter to our church. We'd love the opportunity to hear what God is doing in your life. So in the meantime, as we leave from here today, know that God's power is upon you. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore until we see him face to face. We are so glad you could join us today. I hope you can join us again next week as we continue to look at how Jesus Christ has come to die for you and me. So have a blessed week and we'll see you next time.